disaster became a regular occurrence for a Norwegian woman who, above all in life, wanted to be rich. Mysterious deaths, unexplained disappearances, and even an inferno all roped together to a fraudulent murderess who became notorious for being perpetually cloaked in tragedy and cold blood. She remains as being one of America's most infamous killers. Tonight on Dark Curiosities, the twisted tale of Belle Gunness. Brynhild Paulsdatter Storseat, later known as Belle Gunness, was born on the 22nd of November 1859 in the Norwegian village of Selbu. She was the daughter of a stonemason, and during her early life, the family suffered enormously from financial problems. As a young woman, Belle became enchanted by the American dream and driven by hopes of becoming wealthy, she packed her bags and travelled to the United States between 1881 and 1886. Money was always Belle Gunness's motivation. She did not care what it took and she went to incredible lengths in order to get what she wanted. Originally, Belle settled in Chicago, Illinois, and she went on to marry Mads Sorensen, another Norwegian immigrant, with whom she had several children, Myrtle, Lucy, Caroline and Axel, plus an adopted daughter, Jenny Olsen. Two of her children, Caroline and Axel, passed away from acute colitis, both infants' deaths providing Gunness with insurance money. What slipped past the coroner, however, was that the symptoms shown by the children were similar to that of a person suffering from strychnine poisoning. One night, the couple's confectionery store and home was mysteriously burned to the ground. They went on to claim the insurance money for both properties. Following this incident, in 1901, Mads suddenly died from apparent heart failure on the day both of his life insurance policies overlapped. Sorensen's family were extremely suspicious about Belle and the convenience this caused her and wished for authorities to begin an inquiry, but no charges were ever brought. The doctor who examined Mad's body at first determined the cause of death as being strychnine poisoning, however this was later overruled by another medical professional and changed to heart failure. Once again, Belle escaped with her freedom and today's equivalent of $217,000. In 1901, the widowed Belle, along with her three children, purchased a farmhouse on 42 acres of land in Laporte, Indiana, using the money from her late husband's life insurance payout. It was reported a part of the farm also burned down, and once again, Belle collected her beloved money from the insurance. Belle met Peter Gunness, a widower with two daughters. They married fairly quickly in April 1902, and once again, misfortune struck. Mere days after their wedding, Peter Gunness's infant daughter died at seven months old. Peter knew with his gut instinct that something was awry, and sent his other daughter, Svanhild, away to live with her uncle. Peter Gunness would become his wife's next victim. During the night of the 18th of December 1902, young Jenny Olsen fled to nearby neighbours, urging them to come quickly. Peter was sprawled, lifeless on the kitchen floor, Belle sobbing over him. A doctor discovered a bloody wound on the back of Mr Gunness's skull. After being questioned by authorities, Belle explained that a meat grinder had fallen from a shelf and hit her husband on the back of his head. Of course, investigators were highly sceptical of Bell's explanation and ordered an inquest following a coroner's report indicating that Peter was indeed poisoned by strychnine. No hard evidence could be recovered and, ultimately, Gunness was still a free woman. Six months after Peter's death, Bell Gunness gave birth to a son, Philip. Jenny was actually overheard by classmates, confiding in friends, stating, My mama killed my papa. 
She hit him with a meat cleaver and he died. Don't tell a soul. Still desperate to fill her pockets with coins, despite raking in her second husband's life insurance payout, approximately $81,000 in today's money, Belle Gunnis turned to the Lonely Hearts columns in the Norwegian language newspapers of the Midwest. She had high hopes of luring wealthy men onto her farm, and she was successful in doing so many times. She was of an unusual stature for the time, a six foot frame and 250 pounds in weight. Although she could do all the necessary chores on the farm, in the fields, hogs pen and dairy barn, she wanted some help, not only to keep the farm ticking over, but to feed her hunger for dollars. In the autumn of 1906, young Jenny Olsen, who was 16 years old, mysteriously vanished. Bell had formed the opinion that Jenny had been a liability since the death of Peter Gunnis, so her disappearance did rouse suspicions from locals. She explained to those who were concerned that Jenny had taken up residence at a finishing school in Los Angeles, California. However, Jenny Olsen was never heard from again. Residents nearby did not find it particularly surprising how many suitors Belle attracted. She was considered a beauty, tall and blonde, with a wide white smile. A string of men took it upon themselves to visit what would be known as the murder farm, from where they would never leave. A few of these men include John Moo, Henry Gerholt, Olaf Sven Herod, Ole B. Budsberg, Olaf Lindblom and Andrew Helyelin. The latter's brother, Esli Helyelin, became suspicious when he heard nothing from his brother Andrew. He wrote a letter to Gunnis inquiring about his whereabouts, however Bell told him that she had never seen him before. Despite this reply, Esli set out to travel to Laporte, however he would be too late. In July 1907, Bell had hired a new farmhand named Ray Lampier. He was 11 years her junior and fell in love with her, finding himself jealous of her various other suitors. Due to factors surrounding her suitors, Ray and Bell became locked in a constant battle where Bell accused Ray of harassment and he insinuated that she had been responsible for claiming the lives of her husbands and daughter. Bankers too found themselves scratching their heads at how often Bell Gunnis would cash large sums of money on behalf of the handyman she hired. Joe Maxson was hired in early 1908. On April 27th, he helped Bell unload her groceries and a full can of kerosene, which she had bought in the town. They shared a meal together before Joe retired to bed for the night. At approximately 4am, he woke to the suffocating smell of smoke. It did not take long for Maxon to realise that the house had caught fire and he instantly escaped from the property. He checked the windows of the children's bedrooms, only to find them empty. By morning, the tale only became more horrifying. Inside the blackened remains of the farmhouse, authorities recovered four human bodies, three of which were children, presumed to have been those of Lucy, Myrtle and Philip. Alongside them was a woman's corpse, however, it was headless. At first it was believed to have been the skeletal remains of Belle Gunnis, yet upon closer inspection it did not match as this skeleton was much smaller. Nearby, a dental bridge belonging to Bell was found, which the coroner found as sufficient evidence to confirm that the headless corpse was Bell Gunnis. During the searching of the farmstead and surrounding land, Aisley Helyelin arrived to find his brother. He spoke with the sheriff and insisted that the farm be thoroughly checked. Unconvinced by what he was witnessing, Aisley spoke with Joe Maxson, asking if there were any places Bell dug holes for things like cinders. He was led to the hog's pen, where a gruesome discovery was made. Around 11 or 12 bodies were recovered in the search effort at the hog's pen, and 
Heartbreakingly, Aisley found the remains of his brother, Andrew, who had been dismembered and put into flower sacks. One of the other bodies belonged to Belle's foster daughter, Jenny, who had not been seen since 1906. The fields were also searched and many other remains were recovered, yet many were left unidentified. Attention quickly turned to Ray Lampier. Following the coroner's report, adamant that it was Belle's body found in the burnt-out farmstead, he was charged and put on trial. Ray was found guilty and convicted with arson, not murder, but later told authorities that he had aided Belle in burying the victims. She had killed about 42 people. She would feed them a meal, poison their coffee and hit them with the meat chopper, alternating between burying the victims in shallow graves and feeding their remains to the hogs. Many years later, whilst in prison, Ray made a deathbed confession. Days before the Inferno, which took place on the 28th of April 1908, he had travelled to Chicago to collect a new housekeeper hired by Belle Gunness. Little did he know Belle's true intentions. Belle had concocted an evil plot. She murdered the housekeeper and removed her head, which was actually never recovered by police, using the remains as her body double in the fire she had planned to light in hopes that the authorities would believe it to be her. She drugged her children and left them in the house to perish in the fire. Ray said it was her idea all along to fake her own death, withdrawing money from her bank accounts in her escape, fleeing with what she held closest to her heart. Endless riches. Belle Gunness had gotten away with murder. Her death was never confirmed, and recent DNA tests were inconclusive on the headless corpse. Several sightings were reported in the Chicago area, but authorities were unable to track her down. The story does not end here, however. In 1931, a woman named Elizabeth Carlson, also known as Esther, died in Los Angeles whilst awaiting trial for fatally poisoning a man. There was no doubt that Esther looked remarkably similar to Belle Gunness and was of the same age, but perhaps the most incredible evidence is that she had in her possession a photograph of three children which strikingly resembled the children of Belle Gunness. A tale full of twists and turns, the famous Norwegian-born serial killer Belle Gunness earned herself more than notoriety. The Black Widow, The Lonely Hearts Killer, Lady Bluebeard, and The Devilish Hell's Bell. Despite so much information in this case, the fate of Belle remains unknown. Did she lose her life in the fire? If she indeed faked her own death, where did she go? Was Ray's confession the truth? Were Belle and Esther the same person? What ultimately became of Belle Gunness? The nightmare on Murder Farm, come to an end, yet over a century on, continues to intrigue and terrify.